Hello and a warm welcome to Econoday Unplugged. It's Tuesday, the 18th of October, 2022. Toe Sheehan's on the US East Coast, Brian Jackson's in Sydney, and I'm Jeremy Hawkins in London. Just last week, the IMF again trimmed its 2023 global growth forecast, this time from 2.9% to 2.7%. That's nearly a full percentage point short of the call it made in April and down from the expected 3.2% this year. Moreover, risks to the outlook remain on the downside. It also sees more than a third of the global economy contracting this year or next and warned that for many people, it's going to feel like recession. However, with inflation so high and in many cases central banks too slow to respond, interest rates are generally still headed north. At the same time, as the UK has found out at great cost in recent days, investors are loath to see already bloated public sector borrowing rise any further, limiting room for fiscal support. So against this complicated policy backdrop, recession risks would seem to be building quite steadily. So in today's podcast, we'll have a look at regions around the world and see just how badly or perhaps not quite so badly they're actually faring. So as usual, we'll go stateside first and start with Terry. Terry, just quickly going back to the IMF. So their latest forecast for US growth this year is a meagre 1.6%. So that's a 0.7 percentage point downgrade from what they were forecasting in July and some 2.1 percentage points off from what they were saying in April. Um, now, they kept their forecast unchanged for next year at the just 1.0 percent. But we have President Joe Biden's view at the moment suggesting that any recession will be very slight. But new Bloomberg survey of Wall Street economists put out what a couple of days or so ago put the probability of a downturn in the coming year at 60 percent. And indeed, Bloomberg Economics' own model crew, uh, they're talking about the chance of recession at least 100 percent in the next 12 months. So bottom line, who's right? Um, I would tend to favor the Bloomberg outlook on this one. I don't know about 100 percent, but uh, from what we can see in the economic data so far for October, although our labor market still seems to be holding up pretty well. Uh, there are signs uh, that consumer spending is falling off um, in advance of the winter holidays. Uh, consumers are seeing gasoline prices going up again. Uh, and the inflation worries are definitely more persistent. So um, I, I see there's a strong possibility of a recession. How important then is going to be the housing market? I noticed um, from the NAHB market index, that fell for what, the 10th straight month down to, um, I think it's 38 or something around that in October. And that's about what half a level it was half a year ago or so. Well yes. below market forecast and its lowest reading since August 2012. So how much importance do you think or significance will be the what appears to be a fairly sharp slowdown of the US housing market have on overall economic growth, do you think? Well, I think it's having already having a, a very large cooling impact. Um, we're seeing a strong possibility that our 30 year fixed rate for a mortgage is going to top 7% soon. Uh, we haven't seen that in over 20 years. Uh, I will say that the NAHB index uh, covers single family home builders. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there are signs that those who are buying homes are uh, starting to look more at multi-unit properties, which are less expensive. So uh, it, I don't think it's a complete collapse in, in new home market, but it's a very decided downturn. And from the forecasts I've seen, they're not expecting it to turn up much into 2023. OK, more generally then for well, look at the consumer sector and U.S. retail sales. Um, now, I know, unfortunately, from European side, since most of our sales days are measured in volume terms, yours are done in nominal terms. But if I got it right, if you just simply deflate by the CPI, fair enough, not necessarily the best deflator, but nonetheless, it gives an idea of what's going on. Real U.S. retail sales in September, I think, were down for, what, the fourth month in the last five. So what's actually happened to the overall consumer sector now? Is that becoming much more, I don't know, much more of a potential down factor in U.S. economic growth, given what's going on with U.S. rates now? 
I think so. Uh, this is the October, November, December period is critical for consumer spending in the U.S. You know, going into the holidays, mm -hmm. and it just really looks like consumers have turned more cautious, even in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's some of it is probably the short-term increase in gasoline prices that rents are going up steadily uh, and food prices continue to go up steadily. So, you know, most households are seeing significant declines in their discretionary income. Right. So if we say in demand starting to slow now, I guess it comes down to you know, the ongoing imbalance between demand and supply ignoring external factors and what's going to happen on inflation. So what did the last U.S. employment report tell us then about the supply side of the economy? Well, it's telling us that there is still a significant labor shortage in many respects. We had a decrease in the unemployment rate where everyone was looking for a slight increase. Uh, the labor force is not growing and there are still lots of job openings out there. Uh, some of them are going away as businesses are getting more cautious and more worried about possibility of a recession, but there is relatively little layoff activity, uh, which is usually a big indicator of recession. So businesses are holding on to their workers. They've invested more in them in terms of compensation, and they are not confident they'll be able to replace workers they lose. Interesting. Yeah, I think certainly about from uh, brand side, but certainly from Europe, we've seen exactly the same sort of thing. Well, I guess as far as the Fed's concerned, indeed, so many other central banks, it still you know, ultimately comes down to what's going on with inflation. So the US September CPI came out at a time when there was this kind of talk starting to bubble away in the markets about potential pivot coming up from the Fed. It mm -hmm. was stronger than expected. What do you think that actually means you know, for F FOMC policy for the next one coming up? Well, I think we're going to see another 75 basis point hike in short term rates. Uh, it just is pretty clear that whatever relief they got on upward price pressures over the summer, that's gone away now. Um, I think they're hopeful that it's not getting a lot worse um, and that, you know, they have maintained their credibility as an inflation fighter based on inflation expectations. But we have heard a lot of talk and almost universally, they're saying they're not going to let up on rate hikes until the job is done. Mm. Uh, oh. I, All right. I, Sorry, I think yeah. so. You know, we will, um, their last forecast indicated that there's maybe 125 basis points of further rate hikes expected this year right. and then leveling off next year. I think that could well happen, but we are still going to see fairly significant rate hikes at least for the next meeting or two. Okay, fair enough. And last one from me, I'm going to ask you, last week we had the FOMC minutes out. Was there anything at all in those minutes which suggested any kind of potential shift in the FOMC or you know, Fed a little bit further down the road? Are we getting anywhere close now? You mentioned about you know, what's already in terms of what kind of intimated in uh, perhaps the dot plots, but you know, do you think we're actually getting close to the top of the interest rate cycle now, if indeed you know, the lights of domestic demand is beginning to slow and perhaps it might even be slowing rather more than the Fed could be expecting? Yes, I think we're getting there. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I, I do know that there was one comment in the minutes that uh, there was some concern that about going too far on rate hikes, but they would rather do mu too much than too little and allow inflation to become entrenched. So um, I think they are going to, if they're erring, they are going to err on the side of uh, trying to crush inflation while they can. 
Yeah. OK, thanks for that, Tony. I must say, I think that's an interesting point as far as in investors are concerned at the moment, whether or not it was getting to the stage now whereby, given that some of these real side economic indicators are coming in, typically below expectations that some of these central banks may feel obliged to tighten a little bit too far. OK, OK, let's move quickly across the border then to Canada. As I mentioned, Max uh, is not around as far as this week's concerned. So I'll just put a few uh, words in on Canada on, um, on for him. Um, what do we got? Well, I guess as far as just going quickly back to the IMF forecast, as we've talked about on previous podcasts, Canadian economy has actually held up pretty well this year. Uh, the IMF now is still is uh, forecasting 1.5% GDP growth uh, 2023. That's after an estimated 3.3% this year, which ain't great. But nonetheless, it's still ahead of the US, Europe, just a tick short of Japan. In fact, despite some signs of cooling in domestic demand, September's employment re- report pointed to, I guess, there's still a fairly wide gap between it and supply. And so while headline inflation has cooled, I mean, it's up at 8.1 percent in June. It was down to 7.0 percent in August. And tomorrow we'll get the September report. And that's expected to see a further slowdown to 6.6 percent. The core inflation rate has still risen every month so far in 2022. It's up at 5.3 percent from uh, under three and a half percent at the beginning of the year. So in terms of inflationary pressures, they're certainly still there. And in addition, the central bank. Uh, the Bank of Canada is clearly becoming more worried about US dollar strengths. Um, just uh, last week, Governor Macklem was warning that if the Canadian dollar's depreciation continues, there's going to be more work to do on interest rates. That said, the 100 basis points hikes we saw earlier on this year probably appears to be a thing of the past. Yesterday is the Bank of Canada's own quarterly business survey found most businesses expecting recession in Canada within at least the next 12 months or so. There's also some early signs in the survey suggesting that pressures on prices and wages have started to ease. All that said, firms' inflation expectations remain high. So as far as next week's Bank of Canada meeting goes, well, 75 basis points still looks probably probably uh, the most likely outturn, outturn, but it seems unlikely that we'll see anything larger. But it's interesting that a number of central banks and certainly want to talk about to Brian about this, that dollar strength is becoming an issue in terms of what's happening to their domestic monetary policies. And talking to Brian, then, well, let's move south to Asia. Um, China. <laughs> China, Bron, a lot going on there. Let me kick off by saying, um, as you put in the Econo Day's calendar, I think it was yesterday, um, they decided to delay major economic data for um, release in October, notably including the third quarter GDP report in the midst of, of course, the uh, the week-long Congress, which is very much expected to reappoint Xi as the Chinese president. Is there anything going on here? Is it politics? Um, what do you think is happening? Well, I mean, obviously, it, it raises a lot of suspicions that uh, you know the, the numbers are not what they would like them to be, and it would be you know inconvenient to to publish them in the middle of of the Congress and you know this uh, expected reappointment uh, of, of of President Z for another five years. Um, yeah, it's 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 definitely um, a, a new development. Or, you know, if we go back, this is this this Congress happens every five years. It's a mm-hmm. it's a huge deal, and if we go back. Five years ago to 2017, um, you know there was data scheduled to be released at the same time, and it came out, uh, you know, w- without any problems. So it, it definitely does raise um, questions about why it would be uh, postponed. It's not as if uh, authorities didn't realise that this was happening at this time, and so you would have thought if if they did think that there was going to be an issue with uh, releasing it at you know, during the Congress, they would have uh, announced. A change to the schedule well in advance of of, um, of when they did, so yeah, it, it's obviously very opaque uh, the decision making behind it. But uh, you know, the bottom line is uh, we are expecting the, the the economic data to show an ongoing uh, you know severe impact of, of of the zero COVID policy that Beijing has in place, and um, there's no signs of them of of them pulling back from that policy. 
That's what I was going to ask you, because I presume it's an, on the assumption that the Congress comes out with the, you know, the expected renomination of Z as, um, as as widely anticipated, then the idea that we could see any kind of relaxation of zero, co zero COVID policies is, is pretty well zero. And what that's actually going to mean in, in, in terms of the Chinese economy, and we talked about in you know, the intro about the IMF, their, their latest forecast, and the World Bank came out where well, I think at the back end of last month, and they were talking about growth in China, if I remember rightly, it's just below 3%. Um, and they're expecting that Chinese growth will lag behind the rest of Asia for the first time since 1990. I mean, how significant do you think that might be in, in terms of, I don't know, any kind of pressure it might put on the Chinese administration to modify its policies somewhat? I mean, clearly they've already injected a lot into the Chinese economy. The, the, the central bank has been cutting interest rates and doing other bits and pieces to keep the economy a look, keep got economy going along. But I guess you know the bottom line to all this little lot is: uh, Are they combined doing enough? Yeah, well, I, I think the World Bank is is a bit more gloomy than the IMF. So if you look at the WEO, um, the IMF um, did you know did their big downward revision to the to the growth forecast back in April. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, back in July. So relative to, to July, they haven't really changed the forecast for China right. too much, just slightly weaker. Um, but and, and they also do have actually China growing more quickly this year than the rest of Asia, but not next year, as you say. So um, yeah, the, the you know no matter who you uh, whose forecast you use, yeah, they're, they're definitely showing growth to be. Uh, much weaker than is typically the case for China. And so, um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's a, a thing that fiscal policy or monetary policy can really offset if, if you're going to continue to to shut down huge swathes of, of industry every time there's a COVID yeah. outbreak. There's only so much that uh, uh, policy, you know, economic policy levers can do to, to offset that. Uh, and until uh, we see, uh, you know, a real improvement in um you know beijing's assessment of of the of the public health outlook and a, and a change in their strategy about how to deal with uh COVID, uh it, it's hard to see a really uh, substantial recovery in in economic activity and it's just, it's just really beholden to this uh public health uh, policy that we've got at the moment right uh, and a knock on effect from that i guess um comes down to the chinese currency as well the remember i mean in line with i guess most currencies around the world uh, the yeah. dollar has made significant uh, gains against uh, renminbi, uh, as I say, pretty well against all currencies at the moment. And there's interesting rumours coming out the back end of, what was it, a couple of weeks or so ago, uh, at least according to Reuters anyway, when China supposedly was telling state-owned banks to get ready to sell dollars and buy the renminbi in, a pro in an effort to prop up a local currency. I mean, it, is that also a reflection of the fact that they're getting a bit concerned now about the level of the currency in terms of its implications for economic growth? Growth going forward. Oh, I mean, I, I think that's just a, a concern that everyone has at the moment about uh, what what uh, US dollar strength is doing, uh, you know, right across the board. And it, I mean, we we are at least. I mean, China can at least uh, have a little bit of uh, comfort from the fact that it's not so far resulting in a huge uh, surge in inflation. Uh, they have been able to to keep that uh, under control, probably because, as I said, the you know the rest of you know, the domestic economy is, is going pretty slowly. So they haven't had to deal with the same surge in, in inflation that other central banks across uh, the world are, are experiencing at the moment. So that, um, but, you know, they're, they're obviously, um, you know, they, they would basically prefer a much stabler uh, exchange rate. That's that's always their preference. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, as I said, the, the inflation uh, impact of it hasn't been so too severe yet. Okay, I say on, on contrast to many other countries, I suppose you know, Chinese inflation remains pretty low at the moment. Right, yeah. um, unless you particularly want to say something else about China, I was going to move into your immediate part of the world and the uh, Reserve Bank of Aussie in Australia. Um, RBA then, beginning of this month, only put interest rates up 25 basis points, which in a context of many central banks these days is you know, hardly worth the effort. Does this, do you think, signal, uh, oh, I hate using this word pivot, it's not a very English word, I like inflection point, but anyway, that's neither in nor there. But do you think this actually signals now that the days of 50 basis points out of the RBA are over and in future, if we are going to see further interest rates, we're now down to just 25 basis points or perhaps even less? Uh, I, 
I, I think that's likely. You know, I, I think it'd be unusual if they started, you know, if they were uh, rotating between 25 and 50 uh, on a regular basis. I, I think you would like to uh, have a little bit more predictability and stability in what you're doing. And so, um, you know, I think that would be their hope that you know, going forward they can get away with just moving in 25 basis point uh, increments. But, yeah, they'll, they'll obviously uh, won't commit themselves to that uh, to that stance, they'll they'll uh, say that you know we're going to review it every month and and you know take into account what's going on. Uh, you know the minutes came out for that meeting uh, just yesterday, and uh, they they did show that um, there was discussion. You know, do we go fifty or do we go twenty five basis points? And there was a lot of back and and forth on that issue, um, just weighing up the pros and cons of both of those options. But the the bottom line was they concluded that you know okay we've already raise rates, you know, over 200 basis points in the, in the last few months. Um, and we expect that, you know, the, the, the impact of, of that policy tightening is still, you know, down, coming down the pipeline. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's wind it back a bit, uh, at least for the time being. Um, so so is, that, can I, that, can that I, would I, be my expectation. Okay, yeah, can I ask you, I mean, as I say, you know, we come so used now to central banks hiking aggressively. What do you think is, in, well, to the extent you can actually you know, determine that specifically responsible for the RBA deciding to cut down to just 25 basis points as opposed to 50, let's say? Well, you know, the minutes, in the minutes they say, look, we've already gone pretty hard over the last six months or so, uh, and we expect the full impact of that uh, is going to be felt, you know, going forward in the next, you know, say six or twelve months. So, uh, based on that, they think, well, we don't have to keep on going as hard, um, you know, going forward. And it, it obviously also probably reflects concerns about, uh, you know, what what these rate hikes are doing to household finances and, uh, uh, you know, consumer confidence and you know a whole range of things. So, um, just having a little bit more. Um, awareness of the potential downsides of going too quickly has probably factored into the decision as well. Uh, yeah, and they're they're just betting um, that what they've done so far will uh, help to get inflation back uh, to where they want it to be uh, eventually. But um, you know, just mindful of of you know some of the the downside risks of going too aggressively. Mm. Uh, I think you know, that's going to be an interesting point to see how yeah, other yeah. sectors. Yeah, you know, I think it's a. A, you know, a standard sort of calculus that you know you have to weigh whenever you you do embark on a very aggressive tightening policy, you know, tightening uh, cycle, and um, you know th th there are always going to be those trade-offs between uh, uh, you know going very aggressively to try and get inflation down or, or going too hard. Yeah, I must say, I was personally I was quite quite interested in the fact that you know these these market operators will look at a central bank and they'll see an increase, let's say, 75 basis points and the next CPI out of whether it may be is stronger than expected. And the automatic view is, ah, oh, well, that wasn't enough. Whereas yes. we all know that monetary policy works with long and variable lags. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the likes of the RBA has got it right. And perhaps the likes of, from what Terry was talking about, another 75 basis points out the Fed, um, probably another similar size increase out the likes of the ECB and Bank of England over here. And they're actually going uh, at it, the, putting it too hard. Yeah, and just on that, I think the RBA, though, is also showing that it's it's prepared to be a bit patient to get uh, mm -hmm. inflation back down to where it, it, it wants. You know, it's, it's current forecast still have inflation being well above target all through 2023 right. and, and only getting to the top of the range by the end of 2024. So, you know, they're, they're, they're basically saying over the next two years, inflation is still going to be above target, but, you know, we're prepared to, you know, sort of uh, get down to target gradually rather than sort of this, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of shock and awe program of getting it down, you know, very, very quickly. Right. Compare and contrast then. If we go across the waters for you to, to New Zealand and the Reserve Bank of Kiwi, uh, where are we? October the 4th, um, if I remember rightly, 50 basis point increase to three and a half percent, which was no great surprise for the market. But 75 basis points was under consideration. So do you think there's a risk now that perhaps the RBNZ might be going a little bit too far, too quickly? Uh, yeah, there's risk, definitely. Uh, and again, they'll, they'll be weighing up, you know, pretty much the same uh, factors that, that the RBA is. Uh, they might come to a slightly different uh, conclusion on, on the margin, but, you know, I think, you know, it, you know the, the message is clear. They still have quite a bit of tightening to go and they still want to get inflation down as quickly as they can. So, 
uh, you know, we, we had the inflation numbers this week and they were strong again. And so that's just going mm-hmm. to, I think, reinforce that that assessment that they've got to keep on going. Uh, but, you know, like the RBA, they'll be mindful of, of the of the impact of, of being too aggressive. Uh, and so they'll try and calibrate it. They, they'll, they'll come to probably, if you go on historical trends, they'll probably be a bit more aggressive than the RBA. But, you know, I, again, I don't think they're going to be trying to, to crash the economy and get inflation down to a target, you know, in the next you know, six months, they'll be prepared to be a little bit patient as well. OK, on a related note to sort of um, RBA, RBNZ policy, um, the RBA now we know, well, RBA, the, the, the Australian stats people are coming out now with a, a monthly CPI target, which yeah. means, if I got it right, that New Zealand's going to be the only nation, the OECD, that doesn't publish a monthly inflation report. And I, I don't know, you, I'm sure you can correct me, but I don't think it's got any plans to do so. And yet this quarterly inflation number is so important to policy. Is there any particular the reason why they don't appear to be following sort of almost the rest of the world in coming out with monthly CPI reports? Uh, I yeah, I don't really, um, I haven't really heard any particular reason why that's not being done. Uh, that you know, I guess they might, yeah, you know, just have have a different view of how, of how they should be uh, allocating their resources within the stats department in New Zealand. You know, you, you're right that it would be. Um, yeah, you know, seen by definitely the RBNZ as a as a, a pretty useful thing to have, um, and you know, so maybe that is on on the agenda at some stage. But there's been no sort of public announcement that there's the plans to move that. You know, it's definitely a, a good outcome for Australia to sort of be moving in that direction and getting a little bit more uh, uh, information on on the inflation numbers. But I, I guess also you could say that you know, even if we don't have the numbers out monthly. Generally speaking, policymakers have a pretty good idea of the of the way right. things are going uh, with, with inflation. Uh, you know, there are some uh, other sort of indicators out there that give you a, a bit of a, 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 a hint on what's happening. And um, yeah, you don't generally see huge changes in in economic policy from from month to month. So you know, perhaps having that quarterly number has been enough uh, to to give policymakers enough of a handle on. On what what is happening with inflation, but again, ha- having uh, more regular information, I'm sure would be welcome. Okay, unfair question to you, but I was interested to know what you're going to say. I must say, just going back, because I'm so old now that when I joined the Bank of England many, many, many years ago, they only ever looked at quarterly trends in inflation or economic data since they regarded monthly figures having far too much statistical noise. Who knows? It might turn out to be right after all. Um, anyway, sticking with your part of the world. Um, some of the countries we don't tend to talk about so so often in Korea, uh, the uh, the back of Korea, uh, South Korea, obviously I'm talking about here, up 50 basis points to 3 percent. Was it last week from Baratly, wasn't it? Um, market expected 50 basis points, but we had a couple of dissenters for the first time, which came out of well, the first time a long while anyway, which came with something of a surprise. So are the signs that perhaps uh, interest rates in that part of the world might be getting towards the top? Or at least they're starting to think more and now about you know, some of the implications of the recent tightening on uh, domestic economic activity. Yeah, well, the, the Bank of Korea was one of the first to, to actually start tightening policy um, among major central banks, um, mm-hmm. not only in this region, but all around the world. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's natural, um, given that they have uh, tightened pretty aggressively over the last six to 12 months, that uh, there would be some, uh, you know, thought given to, you know, coming to an end to that, to that, uh, that uh, tightening cycle. Um, Overall, though, I would say that still the, the balance of risks it, uh, does favour that they've got um, a little bit more uh, in, in the tank um, to, to go, just given you know the, the fact that inflation is still pretty strong there. Um, but again, you're going to be seeing uh, this sort of uh, calculation of, of the downside to, to tightening policy too aggressively from at least uh, some officials there. Um, uh, and also, I think just the fact that the, the Fed is still... Uh, very much in, in tightening cycle is going to to weigh on on what other central banks are, are thinking that they have to do as well. Yeah, good. That's that's something I wanted to ask you. I mentioned earlier about well, in terms of the Bank of Canada, they've certainly got an eye on what Fed's doing um, with regards to implications for the Canadian dollar and so their monetary policy. But of late, it's put in your part of the world. So talking about. South Korea, we saw the I think the central bank was intervening very aggressively in the second quarter of this year, 
Well, I think it's one of the most aggressive we've seen in a, in a, in a long time, certainly since they started to close in the figures anyway. And just moving across to the likes of India, we've seen the rupee, Indian rupee slide into a record lows against the dollar over the course of the last few weeks. And um, certainly, at least as far as the traders were saying anyway, the Reserve Bank of India had been busy selling dollars to try and support the currency. So as well as you, it's sort of you know, generally across your region, how much of a problem for the regional central banks now is the strengths of the dollar becoming in terms of perhaps dictating policy, monetary policy in a direction that they might not be quite so keen to follow so aggressively? I, I think most officials um, uh, are just, just wanting you know, to see a bit of stability come, come into uh, uh, markets. That's, you know, they, they can handle, I think, uh, uh, exchange rates being weak uh, relative to you know whether we're a couple of years ago, but just the uncertainty and 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 the sharpness of the moves is probably the thing that's giving them most concern. You know, not knowing how much further further it's going to go. Uh, you know, there's there's obviously also the the concerns that it's having on on imported inflation across the region. Um, at, at the moment, I think you know they they've, they've still got uh, you know enough arsenal, you know enough ammunition in the arsenal to. To counter, you know, very aggressive uh, moves in the currency. But if it continues on this path, uh, you know, for an extended period, then yeah, it's, it's going to cause more headaches. Okay, fair enough. Um, actually, on that note, Terry, can I ask you um, something which appears to be we're seeing from central banks around at the moment, um, talking you know, like the, you know, the South Korea and um, the gentleman in J Japan and so on. A lot of these central banks are having to sell U.S. Treasury dollars with a view to getting hold of U.S. dollars to help them to intervene. Is, is the Federal Reserve or U.S. Treasury any concerns about that, or do they just see that as part and parcel of the way financial markets work? I, I think they're con considered, at least right now, part of the normal operations. I know the weekly... Uh, balance statements from the Fed uh, have seen a lot more central bank swap activity than we've seen mm -hmm. for a while, uh, but they're being pretty calm about it and saying that markets are functioning reasonably well. So um, there doesn't appear to be any alarm about it yet. OK, fair enough. Being what happens as we go forward. Um, right, before we move on to Japan then, uh, Mr. Jackson, anything else from your side you would like to put in? Oh no! I think that's uh, you know we, we've uh, covered a fair fair bit, and we'll we'll uh, move on to see what's going on in your part of the world. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for that, Brian. All right, let's quickly move across then to uh, round off some, some bits and pieces. Uh, starting with Japan then, say with um, Max not around today. IMF call for Japanese growth in uh, 2023 is 1.6%, which I guess is quite respectable versus the rest of G7. Still only down just to, what one point from versus 1.7% in 2022, though, and that's still really relatively soft as far as the BOJ is concerned. And that's why we get into next week. The Bank of Japan is widely expected to make yet again no changes to economic policy, bar the possibility, or at least an outside chance anyway, that the board might decide in favour of removing the direction about keeping policy rates below their current levels. Were they to do that, it would constitute just a mini tightening, but at the end of the day, nothing really to write home about. No meaningful move, which is much more likely, would mean that keeping, keeping the current yield curve control parameters for the 10-year JGB yield that would remain targeted at around 0% and uh, using unlimited JGG buying by the central bank to keep it there and the short-term policy rate would also stay at minus 0.1%. However, the exchange rate fall of, fallout, as we're talking in terms of some of the, well, more generally Asian currencies at the moment and the weakness of the yen, it does seem to be prompting uh, growing differences between the central bank and Ministry of Finance. With the Fed still tightening aggressively, the dollar continues its assault on 150 against the yen. And earlier today saw a fresh 32-year high above the 149 level. Now, we've had the chief currency official from the MOF, uh, Masuto Kanda, 
uh, suggesting that the current situation is increasing the chances that Japan will have to be intervene to take the necessary steps again. And indeed, people who remember as only a couple of weeks ago or so ago, we actually saw uh, the Bank of Japan intervening for the first time, uh, about $20 billion worth in September. That's his first intervention to support the yen since 1998. But you have to wonder what use that is when we have the likes of the Bank of Japan governor, uh, Harushi Kiyo Karuda, vowing to keep monetary policy loose in order to support the economic recovery. So although the Bank of Japan is expected to revise up its for inflation forecast for uh, the fiscal 2022 year next week at its BOJ meeting, uh, Karuda said just earlier on today that he expects it to return to a sub 2% rate in fiscal 2023-24. So for now then, bottom line seems to be that the yen remains a favourite carry trade against the dollar and indeed a lot of other high yielding currencies, at least for the time being anyway. It's going to be a bit of a game of chicken, I suggess. But guess between the BOJ and what the markets are, are going to do. But so long as you've got the Bank of Japan intimating it's not prepared to do anything with interest rates, then you've got to assume, I think, that the, the Japanese yen is going to go lower. OK, then. So to Europe, we're round off with things. Um, well, it's the shenanigans of the last few weeks in terms of a UK, which I guess continues still to dominate the markets as far as Europe's concerned and indeed with knock on effects of international markets as well. For anyone who missed it, International investors, I guess, looked on with something of incredulity as at the end of September, the government over here announced an unfunded 45 billion suite of tax cuts aimed at boosting economic growth at a time when inflation was already up at 10 percent. So some eight percentage points above target. Subsequently, a meltdown in domestic bonds and the sharp sell off in stocks and in particular in sterling, which hit a new record low against the dollar, forced the new prime minister, Liz Truss, to sack her finance minister only in the job for 34 days, but also to install a new one, Jeremy Hunt, who just yesterday completely unwound or virtually unwound the entire package in a desperate bid to stabilise markets. So over here then, we're left with a government whose U-turn on fiscal policy is amongst the largest ever seen in UK political history, a prime minister in Liz Truss who is hanging onto the job by a thread, and the likelihood of higher borrowing costs over longer term as investors demand a premium for such a, a remarkable show of, let's be honest, complete policy incompetence. Now, the U-turn has wiped out about 32 billion sterling of the originally planned 45 billion sterling package the stimulus package. Uh, the other measures are already in the process of being legislated in Parliament, or they might well have been axed too. So fiscal policy will still be looser than it was had been before Trust became Prime Minister, but at least not as loose as it uh, would have been in the wake of the mini budget. Nonetheless, for the Bank of England, which was forced to defer its quantitative tightening programme as it had propped up the guilt, as it had to prop up the guilt market at the end of last week, it also probably means a larger rise in interest rates at the November MPC meeting, the first week of November, uh, than would otherwise have been the case. So far, in its seven successive interest rate hikes, it hasn't moved by more than 50 basis points, but chances are it's going to move by 75 basis points, I suspect, next time. Which, of course, is not good news for an economy which, to all intents and purposes, is probably already in recession. August GDP here fell 0.3% on the month. We get monthly data, uh, suggests that a third quarter contraction is very likely. And the recent market turmoil makes another fall this quarter all the more likely. Mortgage rates in particular are going through the roof over here and the housing market is a partic has a particularly big say in terms of how the UK economy works. So there really is a very good chance that we can see a negative fourth quarter UK GDP number, which would officially put the economy into technical recession. So if you're looking for an underperforming economy at the moment amongst the bigger economies, at least over the next six to 12 months anyway, the UK is probably not a bad bet. With regards to the uh, position of the Prime Minister, interestingly, or at least potentially interestingly, a YouGov poll of uh, Conservative Party members yesterday 
found 55% now would vote for Richie Sunak, the ex-chancellor who lost out to Liz Truss in September's leadership contest. That would compare with just 25% for Truss herself. And in fact, a majority, some 63%, think that former Prime Minister Boris Johnson would be the best replacement. So bottom line to all that little lot must be that what that whatever happens to UK politics over the course of the next few months, uh, well, the outlook for UK uh, sterling markets remains extremely volatile. Um, into continental Europe then quickly. Well, still being hit hard by the uh, fallout from the Ukraine war and the EU is still struggling to agree a region wide energy policy. In fact, new proposals were announced by the EU Commission today involving a cap on gas prices and, and trying to pull together demand. But it's not clear that all the members will give the nod. In September, EU gas consumption was actually cut by 15 percent compared to a year ago, but still real concerns that winter shortages and potential blackouts could still come about. In terms of the economic data, they've been pretty mixed for the eurozone the more forward-looking business and uh, particularly the uh, consumer confidence numbers have been especially soft. Indeed, consumer confidence has been a record low for a while now. But the likes of the manufacturing sector had a surprisingly good August. Pull it together, bottom line, I guess that third quarter GDP is going to be close to zero. Could be negative, might manage an increase, but if so, it's going to be a very small one. Even so, many on the uh, European Central Bank Governing Council now are talking openly about a possible, albeit probably mild, recession in 2023. And that's in contrast to the official forecast last time, which suggested the eurozone will continue to grow throughout uh, throughout next year. Um, now, in terms of what the IMF is saying, well, they've gone for both Germany and Italy sliding into technical recession in 2023. Uh, overall Eurozone GDP growth next year is seen up just 0.5 percent. So certainly one of the weakest amongst the, the G7. However, as ever, ECB still looking at the inflation numbers and can't be running up at 10 percent on the headline basis for September, which is stronger than expected. Core rate four and eight percent, also stronger than expected. And from the way most of the comments are coming out from the ECB members at the moment. It looks quite likely that we will see another 75 basis point increase uh, in interest rates. So matching the last time's record record rise, which would put the refi rate up at 2.0 percent, the deposit rate at 1.5 percent. Also, we're probably going to get some talk um, next week's meeting about quantitative tightening. Germany in particular is calling for an early start to outright assets sales, but you really do need to keep an eye on what's going in the bond market, partly courtesy of all the shenanigans in the UK gilt market. The first week of October saw investors dumping a record amount of BTPs as Italian bonds um, uh, over, over that particular period, well, at least the worst, um, the biggest selling spree we've seen since the pandemic, the COVID pandemic first struck. And we've seen BTD spreads versus German bonds testing the 250 basis point level, which is kind of thought to be the ECB pain threshold. So we may get some QT hints next week, but I guess it's unlikely at this stage the programme will start until the, uh, the first quarter of next year at the earliest. But however you want to look at it, Europe at the moment is still very much struggling from the fallout of what's going on in Ukraine. OK, then, I guess that's it from my side. So, Bron, Terry, anything else you want to put in before we round it all off? Not for me. All good. Right. OK. And we won't mention the cricket then since the Australians aren't doing too well. So that's it for today then. Well, uh, what can we say? Well, despite a largely successful battle against COVID, I guess 2022 is proving to be a remarkably volatile year for financial markets. And that's pretty well wherever you look. But while the recent events might mean that economic forecasts, including the IMS latest efforts, probably need to be taken with a larger pinch of salt than usual. The actual data remain at least as important as ever. And the best way to keep up with them and indeed all the other key market moving events is, of course, via Econoday's global economic calendar. So if you haven't done so already, do take a look. So on behalf of Brian, Terry, me, thanks as always for listening. and look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye for now.
Strategic investing and analysis are a lot easier when you can identify patterns and see how economic events and announcements correlate with specific market movements. The Econoday Investors Journal provides a convenient and easy way to follow important economic events every day, every month throughout the year. View the most important market moving events for the upcoming year in a glance. The Econoday Investors Journal is your essential desktop resource for economic events and indicators, FOMC meetings and announcements, US banking holidays, equity settlement dates and more. The Econoday Investors Journal is much more than a financial calendar. It's an indispensable tool to help you anticipate active days in the market. Learn the intricacies and interactions of the market, record daily market activity and explore helpful insights from experienced market analysts. Take advantage of our informative resource centre, which includes a comprehensive glossary of need-to-know terms, clear, concise information on policy and historical trends, useful graphs and a guide to the influencing factors and people to watch at the Federal Reserve. Order your Econoday Investors Journal now at shop.econoday.com.